Welcome to the Hive, everybody. We have a really great show for you today. And if you're new to the Speedway channel, or if this is your first time, please subscribe and leave a comment at the bottom of the page explaining what your impressions of the early day Speedway was. We want to know what you thought of the Speedway. And we're going to start the show right now. The first actor of the Speedway world was this guy here at the bottom. Billy Gray, he played the character Bud in the movie, the TV series, Father Knows Best. And the top left-hand corner was Chris Eckerman's mom, the announcer of Paris and Bakersfield Speedway. That's his mother on the top left. Can you believe that? And Billy Gray was a childhood actor. He was really good. And mostly he was a Speedway rider in the early 70s. He was a uh, he turned Speedway rider. He razzled and dazzled the crowd with his unorthodox yet successful Speedway riding style. Billy Gray was really, truly a great rider. And also we had another rider back in the 70s that actually turned movie actor. And that was Bruce the Fox Penhall. Do you remember Bruce Penhall? He was, he had those Hollywood looks Bruce Penhall was really just a good looking guy and everyone said he was ready for Hollywood and the love boat. You know the TV show, The Love Boat. We're gonna go over there and we're gonna check out what happened at The Love Boat right now. <laughs> Hi everyone. Did you see that The Love Boat is coming back on CBS Access? I'm so excited. I, it's been years since we did it. It was back when I did the Mandrill Sisters show. I got to do an episode with Bruce Pinhall, who actually played Larry Wilcox's little brother in Chips, which I watched all the time. And so that made it even more exciting. So we wanted to share some of it with y'all. Hope you enjoy it. Exciting and Have the time of your life, my treat, Robert. He hasn't forgotten. I wonder what he sends. Happy birthday! I'm Neil. I'm your birthday present for Robert. You mean you saw pictures of me in his locker? Yeah. And you took it upon yourself to send yourself to me as a gift? Yeah, I guess one little nightcap couldn't hurt. Decided to keep your gift. Uh, and I got another one to go along with it. Oh. Somehow both of them look permanent. <laughs> yeah, so Bruce actually popped out of that box. So I have a birthday coming up in April. So I wonder if Bruce the Fox Penhall is going to pop out of his box and say, Happy birthday, Bumblebee. I doubt that one. And Bruce Penhall, he had an amazing Speedway career. He started in the 70s, around the mid-70s. He was just a young guy at age 16. And we're going to talk about his early days right now. He actually competed against Dennis Segalis' dad. And they actually became good friends, even though they were competitors. And Bruce and Dennis's families, they hung out and they 
did lots of things together. Even though they raced and they competed against each other, they were good friends. And then Bruce, a young Bruce and a young Dennis at like eight years old, they were forced to be friends and then they became friends. Bruce and Dennis were often seen in Balboa and Newport Beach sliding around, terrorizing old ladies, doing power slides, and preparing to be a world champion. Who knew at such a young age that a young Dennis and a young Bruce would actually race in Los Angeles in the 1982 World Championship? And Bruce would win his second back-to-back -back World Championship. And Dennis Segalos would finish a very respectable third and earn a spot on the podium. Around the year 1970, Bruce and Dennis as Papas, they actually sponsored a very famous United States Speedway champion, and that was the Rocket, Rick Woods. Rick Woods was a famous legend, an icon in Speedway history, and their Papa went ahead and sponsored them. Bruce and Dennis got a taste of Speedway and they liked it and they thought this would be kind of a cool sport to get into. So Bruce and Dennis went ahead and bugged their papas for a junior Speedway bike. There was only one problem though, that they didn't actually make the junior Speedway bikes way back in the old days before they invented water. It's the old days, there was no junior Speedway bike. So their papas had to actually build their own speedway bike from a McCullough chainsaw engine. It was crazy. It probably sounded like nuts. And they went ahead and they built, their papas built a speedway track on Dennis's papa's land. He has a land at the Orange County Catering Company. It's a huge company. I remember that one. And they went ahead and built a speedway track and Bruce and Dennis would practice daily after school and on the weekends. They just loved the speedway truck and they were addicted. Dennis Sagalos and I are exactly the same age and when I was about 14 and Dennis was about 14, I saw this newspaper clipping of Dennis riding speedway at the OCIR and he probably was at his papa's practice track too. He was just a speedway nut, loved the sport and I was dreaming like, I want to be like Dennis, he's my age. I bought a Speedway bike with my paper route money about the age of 16, just before the end of our first Speedway season. And I went ahead with no experience and I went ahead and asked to be on the program at Costa Mesa Speedway. And I looked on the program, I was on the program the first time. And who was on the program with me his first time? Dennis Segalos. Dennis was an amazing rider. He was like a D1 rider and I was like a D4 rider. I didn't even know how to ride the bike. And I said to myself foolishly like, I could beat Dennis. And the first turn went and I was ahead because I was on the zero yard line. Dennis was on the 10 and Dennis just blew by me. He, just, he lapped me like in the first lap. I was so terrible and I was so sad that Dennis Segalos beat me. Getting back to Bruce Penhall, a young Bruce Penhall, age 16. He had his first race at the Irwindale Raceway. Do you remember that one? And he became a member of the Los Angeles Sprockets later on. But Bruce had his first race. I'm sure he did amazing, probably D2, and quickly went up to D1. Bruce Penhall was just an instant hit, instant success. Everyone loved Bruce Penhall and he was a very famous writer. Bruce was so famous they dedicated a night after him, the Fox Night, where the girls would all get into the spear races free and the guys had to pay, that's not fair. And it was called the Fox Night for why? For what? For who? for Bruce the Fox Penhall. 
Bruce's papa told Bruce, like, he was racing five nights a week, and if you don't keep your grades up, you're not going to race Speedway. So Bruce had to actually ride five nights a week and go to high school. I did the same thing when I went to D1, and it's really hard. You race Tuesday night at Ventura, which you get home like 2 o'clock in the morning, and then Wednesday night at San Bernardino, late again. Thursday night at Irwindale, Friday at Costa Mesa, a little closer to home, and Saturday night at Bakersfield, very far, but it's the weekend. And Bruce had to keep his grades up or his papa would take the Speedway bike away. And Bruce went ahead and blurry-eyed every day and went to school. I know that feeling, it's really hard, and Bruce did it. But Bruce was just an amazing rider, and I raced Bruce when I had my first, first division ride. And I thought I was going to win that handicap race. I was winning the whole way. And at the finish line, who beat me by two inches? Bruce the Fox Penhall. Oh my gosh. I was okay about it because it was Bruce Penhall. I want to win that race. Bruce's dad also hired a good friend, a family friend. And Bruce and him were good friends. He was an Anaheim police officer. Bruce's dad hired him so that he could keep Bruce in line. He said, no more drinking, partying, and getting crazy. So Bruce had to be policed by a police. But that kept uh, young Bruce in line. All the girls were trying to chase Bruce. So having a security guard, a bodyguard, was actually pretty smart by Bruce's papa. And I dated this girl. I actually wanted to date this girl, beautiful, blonde, gorgeous girl, named Debbie Greger. And Debbie had a crush on Bruce Penhall, and I had a crush on Debbie. And I said to Debbie, what's so special about Bruce Penhall? And she's like, oh, my heart. And then she told me this story. I could never get successful with Debbie because she liked Bruce. That's too bad for me. And Debbie was telling me about a story where her girlfriend went ahead and crashed Bruce Penhall's van. He had a van that said Penhall Company. And Bruce, I advertised who he was all the time. And this girl crashed into him. Why? So she could meet the famous Bruce Penhall. I thought, what's an expensive way to meet Bruce Penhall? I'm sure Bruce Penhall didn't date her because he's probably pissed as hell. Bruce just dominated the speedway scene. Young Bruce, he was like a 40 and 50 yard line rider. That means you're a good rider. And in 1976, they did the team racing. I did a blog on that just a day or so ago. And Bruce was number two in points. He averaged over 11 points per match. And he was the number two rider in that speedway league next to his teammate, Michael Bast. 11 points was pretty amazing by young Bruce who was a teenager probably like 18 and the most you could get was 12 points because it was just four rides and then the bonus at the end Bruce raced a total of 10 seasons five in America and five in England and Europe and he was just an amazing rider he won two United States championships And he decided that he was going to go to Europe because he conquered America. Bruce Penhall was going to move on and get out of California to the big time because he had a goal to be a world champion. Oh, the young Bruce Penhall, an amazing guy, a future world champion. He was groomed for success from an early age. From terrorizing those little old ladies at the Balboa Pier, Bruce was just a crazy young guy and a future world champion. So if you like that video, go ahead and subscribe. And we have more videos here on Bruce the Fox Penhall. Yeah, Bruce the Fox Penhall, he was pretty good in his day. And a lot of these guys were just amazing riders. They were really good. And we had the East versus West uh, match here. And we're going to meet some of the early day Speedway stars. These guys were good. My name is Steve Bast. I'm from Loomis, Sherman Oaks, California. My number six, and I rise to the East team. Hello, my name is Mike Bast. I'm from Sherman Oaks, California. I rise to the East team.
I'm out of Cal Canyon Country, California. Fighting for the West team, my number is one. Hi, my name is Bruce Penhall. I'm from Balboa. I'm riding for the East team, and I hope to have a good day of racing. Jeff Sexton, I live in uh, Montclair, and uh, I'm riding for the East team, and numbers number 14, we're here at Irwindale today. Check back on My name's Sonny Nutter, I'm from Topanga, California, number 19, and I'm on the Eastern team. Yeah. My name is Bill Cody, I'm from Garden Grove, California, and I'm on the Western team. I'm Mark Cherry, I'm from Reseda, California, I'm number seven on the West team. I'm from Huntington Beach, California, and I'm here today competing on the West team. My number is number two, and uh, we'll see what happens shortly. My name is Larry Sean from Fuller, California. I'm riding for the East team today, and we're going to put it on them. Hi, I'm Steve Nutter. I'm from Southern California. I'm going to be riding for the West team today, and I'm number 18 today. Thank you. Scott Simmons, do you remember Scott Simmons? He was that last guy in the interview. And a few years later, he was actually at the Grand and Industry Hills. And he was talking more about his speedway. You saw the young Scott Sivich, he was really a good rider. And here he is at the Grand a few years later, uh, quite a few years later. Uh, Scott Sivich from 69 to 75. Can you tell me about some of the memories you had while racing? Um, they were all, most all of them good. Met the greatest people I've ever met. There's most of the people are still, still my dearest friends. The guys that are here and a lot of the people in the stands. Probably my best memories, um, uh, Houston uh, was the first year Wild World of Sports filmed Speedway. It was U.S. versus the world. I actually had a really great race with Anders Meshnik, who was a world champion, or not a world champion, world contender at the time. That was awesome. That was before ESPN and everything else. Went to uh, several trips, Israel and different places with, with all the guys and just... Um, living, living large, you know. Um, I enjoyed every minute of it. A lot of aches and pains now and broken bones, and I wouldn't change a thing. I'd do it all again tomorrow. These kids today are awesome. Uh, the equipment's better. They're going really fast. Um, but um, I don't know that they have any more desire than we had, and that's really what it takes. You just got to be five. We raced five nights a week, by the way. It wasn't once or twice a week. And every night was a new chance to do something great, and a lot of times it happened. It did happen. Those guys were good. All those guys were good. And they had the legend, Bruce Penhall, also, as a little bit older as, than his teenage days. He was at the Industry Hills talking more about his Speedway career. The living legend, Bruce the Fox Penhall. <laughs> Bruce, how many years did you ride Speedway? He's still uh, learning how to ride. He really doesn't know how to ride. Can I, can I talk to you? There's always freaking peanut gallery here. Uh, I rode for 10 years. I rode five years in America and five years in Britain and Europe. What are, the, what are your career highlights, things that stand out in your career? What stands out the most? Well, uh, first was the World Paris Championship in 1981 with Bobby Schwartz in Poland. And that's the first time America had ever won a Paris. Uh, backed it up with uh, the World Individual Championship in 81. 
And then we won the World Team Cup, first time ever for America in 81. Uh, won the uh, National Championship in 81, the California State Championship in 81. 81 was a good year for me. And then uh, there was a lot of great races over in England and Europe that I participated in and won, and then won the World Championship at the Coliseum in 1982 and then retired from the sport. So had a good run with this, with this great sport of Speedway. Can you, can you tell me about your feelings about being inducted into the Hall of Fame? You know, I mean, it's a it's a huge highlight of my life. I I don't know if it, if it's because I'm old now, or because of my accomplish, accomplishments. Uh, yeah, I, I gotta say, you know, I'm I never thought in a million years that I would have been inducted into this. And I got an email a little while ago that Kurt Bush is the uh, honorary chairperson of of the event this year. In fact, we go back to Detroit in about two weeks for the event. So I'm really really stoked. It's a huge honor for me, and I got to tell you that, you know, uh, I was surrounded by a bunch of great people over the years, and I've got to give credit to those that had helped me along the way. I mean, I, I was sitting on the motorcycle, but like I tell all these kids, including my own, the puzzle has to be put together completely before you're going to become successful at anything. And, you know, luck has a lot to do with it, and I was certainly lucky, and, and my puzzle all fit. And, in the right in the right sort of direction so I'm really really excited really stoked and it's a huge honor to be inducted all the pieces of the puzzle did fit for Bruce the Fox panel that's a hundred percent guaranteed and he was shock shocked to be in the AMA Hall of Fame Boy, I don't think so. Bruce Penhall deserved to be there, if anybody deserved to be in the AMA Hall of Fame. But Bruce actually had a lot of accomplishments with this next guest we had, and he went, won a Best Pairs Championship with him, and Bruce had all kinds of success with Bobby Boogaloo Schwartz. Today we're going to talk about a very special writer, very famous writer in U.S. history. His name is Bobby Boogaloo Shorts, number 11 and number one. Bobby Shorts, one of the great writers in U.S. history. Bobby started racing Speedway in the mid 70s. This I see you. It was just an instant D1 rider. The guy was famous from the very beginning. I don't think the guy was bad at all. He just went straight to D1. He wore the yellow and black uniform. Number 126, Bobby Schwartz. They called him the Bumblebee. The Bumblebee. That's my name. And I heard Bobby's name was the Bumblebee, and he was an awesome rider, and still is an awesome rider. He's still racing today. He never quits. Bobby Schwartz, one of the great riders in U.S. history. Bobby is a two-time United States champion in 1986 and 1989. He's a two-time Best Pairs champion, 1981 with Bruce Penhoff. In 1982 with Dennis Sagalos. He's a two-time California State Champion in 84 and 1991. Bobby's a four-time Fair Derby Champion in 1978, 1990, 93, and 94. 
He was a 1982 World Cup champion. And he was the World Cup team captain from 1983 to 1987. I'd like to tell you a story I never told Bobby before. Hopefully he hears about it. When I was watching him race in Costa Mesa, back when he first started, I sat next to a guy who was cheering for Bobby. And I turned around and I said, you like Bobby Schwartz a lot, don't you? And he said, yes, he's my favorite writer. And I said, have you ever met him? And he said, yeah, I've met him many times. And I said, where did you meet him? He says, I am Bobby's brother. And I said, brother, really? And I guess he was like a Hollywood hairstylist or makeup artist. And I sat next to him at Costa Mesa and he was Bobby's number one fan. I don't know whatever became of him or if he's still alive today, but I met Bobby Schwartz's brother and he didn't look like Bobby Schwartz at all, but he sure loved Bobby Schwartz. And I was very like happy to see him rooting for his brother, Bobby Schwartz. Yeah, we're still trying to find out if Bobby Schwartz has that brother still. He was a nice guy, and Bobby Schwartz was just, I mean, if anyone deserves the AMA Hall of Fame, it's Bobby Boogaloo Schwartz. But the 1970s was really great, and it was also the Speedway Riders were all classic and legends, and also just the atmosphere of being at the Speedway, especially if you went to Costa Mesa on Friday nights, every Friday night. It was Speedway at its, at its finest. So going to early day Speedway was really my life. And I just start falling in love with it every race more and more. And it just was part of, you know, who I was. And it just was part of you know who I was. I didn't care how I got there. I didn't care how I got home. It didn't matter. I just wanted to go to Speedway. just loved watching the races and smelling the castor oil and they had actually nitro at the time and the bikes were like rocket ships and all the people were screaming and all the people were screaming and there's always a fight in the stands and it was exciting and Larry Huffman would be uh, announcing and he'd be doing his Shuffle. Mean Gene, the dancing machine, was dancing on the wall. And I mean, early day speedway was good. You missed it. You missed it if you didn't see that. It was awesome. and all the girls, the chicks, and the guys going after the chicks, full house. Everybody went to Speedway. It was awesome.
Another great writer in the 70s, started about 1976, was Siggy. He turned out to be a famous writer. He was good from the start. He was hanging out with Bruce Penhaw, and he just was a great writer. And Siggy's been on the show two times. We really enjoy Dennis Segalos. He's a great guy. And he was over at the Industry Hills uh, at the Grand talking about the Speedway. Uh, when he wasn't a teenager, he was a little older at the time. And he talks his legend night, his Speedway career. Oh, my name is Dennis Segalos. And gosh, that's a tough question. How many years? Uh, a lot. 10, 15 probably, something like that. <laughs> uh, fondest memories is uh, leaving my last period of, out of high school, going to Costa Mesa, cutting my last period of high school, going to Costa Mesa and racing and doing good and then uh, having a good time afterwards. One of the fondest memories. <laughs> He was good, Dennis Segalos. He was a great writer. And there was more great writers in the 70s. We had the Rocket, Rick Woods. He won the 70, 72 uh, United States Championship and the 1968, the Rocket, Rick Woods. And he had a younger brother, Gene Woods. He also started in the 70s. These guys were good, the Woods brothers. Welcome to Baraka Island. We're here in the quarantine, and today we're going to talk about the Woods Brothers, Gene Woods and Rick Woods, number two, number three. They were very famous in American Speedway history, and we're going to talk about it a little bit right now. The Woods Brothers were one of the more famous brother combinations. They won a lot of championships together, so they were good. Together, they won championships in 1968, 1970, 1972, 1980, 1981, and 1984. Those are Speedway championships. They were good. But first, we're going to talk about Gene Woods in his earlier days. He was just... Being the brother of Rick Woods, I mean, what are you going to have? You're going to have a good racer, right? You got that Woods blood in your family. I would love it if Rick Woods was my brother, but he wasn't, so. Gene was very lucky he had Rick. Gene was very famous, too. I used to watch Gene in motorcycle magazines, like the mini bike magazines. I used to go and buy them. And I'd see Gene Woods and Jeff Ward and these kind of guys, Sean Moran, Kelly Moran. And these guys were good. And these guys were excellent. And we'll talk about Gene's accomplishment. I'd say they're a pretty good brother combination, Rick Woods and Gene Woods. They were just two really great writers. And Bruce Penhall was also another good writer. We have all we have all three of these guys at the Industry Hills towards the end of Rick's life. He had passed away. And we talked we actually see Bruce Flanders, the famous speedway announcer, Bruce Flanders. And rest in peace, Bruce Flanders. He passed away this past year. So we have Rick Woods, Gene Woods, Bruce Flanders, and at the end of the video, we have the world champion, Bruce the Fox Penhall. Okay, stay back from the fence line all the way around the facility. Maybe you're not old enough to remember this stuff. Put your gate back up, guys. Oh, wait, Gene Woods will break your tapes. Gene Woods will break your tapes, and if he doesn't, his brother Rick will. 
That's Gene Woods at the controls, Rick Woods riding double with him. Between the Woods brothers, there were more main events, I would imagine, than anybody but the Bass brothers uh, in Southern California. Gene and Rick ready to do this. Oh, no. No helmets, no nothing. Go slow. Putsy putz. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rick Woods won the national championship starting in 1969, several times in the 70s. His brother Gene, I first announced him as a nine-year-old motocrosser at national minicycle events. You know what they don't get to hear? is a crowd. They need to hear a crowd. You're starting it. You're getting there. Nobody's got a skid shoe. Nobody's got a helmet. You kids at home, keep your eyes closed. Come on, talk to them. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, Rick. How'd you let the riding chores get away from you to your younger brother? He wasn't supposed to do that. He wasn't. You, weren't, you were supposed to go slow. I was. Oh, you were. That was slow? Excuse me now? I didn't hear you. That was slow? It was supposed to be a little slower, I thought. A little slower, he said. <laughs> yeah, well, that was good. I thought that it was, was slow. Good. You like that? Hey, wait a minute. These two guys need to hear you. Would you please say hi to the Woods Brothers? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you both for being here tonight. I'm out of breath from sitting there. It's just from riding shotgun, right? Are you racing anything this year? You were doing off-road for a while with trucks. Yeah, we we're doing the stadium off-road stuff. We're just waiting for a little more money to come in, and we'll be okay. You just sponsor, too? So do I. Yeah. Okay. And you, there were questions about your health. You're looking pretty good right now. feel pretty good. Just energy levels real down. Okay, well, next time. I've been on the couch for about six months. Too. And next time you tell him, I'll handle the throttle. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. The Woods Brothers, ladies and gentlemen, once again, if you would. Rick says, I'll handle it. Gene says, no, uh-uh. There have been a few different people win the World Championship of Speedway Motorcycle Racing representing the United States of America. None of them have won it twice. None of them have won it twice. Embracing Rick Woods right there is the only American to win the title twice. Mr. Bruce Penhall. And if I'm not mistaken, over here in this group, all fashionably dressed in black, are Lori Penhall, Mackenzie Penhall, Ryan Penhall, and Connor Penhall. Those are all Penhall offspring. Okay, he can hear you now. Would you say hi to Bruce Penhall? Rick Woods was scared to death. You, you know what? I mean, the reason I'm out here today is because of Rick Woods. And, you know, he's like God to me. It was uh, so great for me to see all my heroes, uh, Berserko Becker, uh, Rick Woods, you know, Mark Cherry. I mean, the list goes on Boogaloo. And, you know, it's, it makes it all worth it. I'll okay. tell you what, though. I am so glad I'm wearing underwear tonight because I'm about ready to crap myself. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce. Are you sure? <laughs> hey, Rick Woods was a legend, and Rick Woods was my idol, too. You know, when Bruce Penhall and I were growing up, we loved Rick Woods, and Rick Woods was really our, our legend. I mean, this guy was just uh, unbelievable. I mean, he made Costa Mesa Speedway. Rick Woods, he was fast. I, You know, as I'm talking to you right now about Rick Woods, I can actually see how fast he was going. He was a great pole rider. He was just fast on the pole. Rick Woods in his early days was pretty much unbeatable in his early days and he actually helped make Costa Mesa Speedway. Welcome back, and today we're going to talk about the opening of Costa Mesa Speedway, the beginning of Costa Mesa Speedway. It was created in 1968 by the world champion Jack Milne. And in 
and Harry Oxley, they went ahead and devised the Costa Mesa Speedway. They planned it. And early in the summer of 1969, in the summer of 69, they opened the Costa Mesa Speedway. It was a early day speedway. We had a lot of these pioneers, sweet savage Rick Woods. We had a young Michael Bass and Steve Bass. We had all these early day speedway pioneers. The summer of 69 was when they had the surf craze, the BMX craze the skateboard craze, the motocross craze. It was just crazy, all the different attention in the summer of 69. And that was a good year for the timing of the opening of the Costa Mesa Speedway. Costa Mesa Speedway helped create the first world champion since 1937. And that was Bruce the Fox Pinhall. He won the first championship since 1937 when Jack Milne won that special event. Costa Mesa Speedway has had only three announcers since 1969. The first was a legendary Bruce Flanders. Rest in peace, Bruce. He was the very first announcer in 1969. And they went ahead and had the next announcer, legendary, famous, Larry Motormouth Huffman. He was amazing. Larry Huffman razzled and dazzled with his Huffman shuffle. And the last announcer they have at Costa Mesa Speedway and current announcer is Terry Ike Clanton. The 70s was the heyday at the Costa Mesa Speedway. You had Gene, Gene the Dancing Machine. You had more beer in the stands. You had crazy dirt where their mud was flying in the stands. You had all the legendary 1970 Speedway riders. The Costa Mesa Speedway holds 6,500 people in the seats. It's a 185-yard oval track. It's a clay base with decomposed granite at the surface. Costa Mesa Speedway has four, four major events every year. The first one is the Jack Milne Cup. The second one is the Warren Russell Cup. And then in the summer, usually in July, they have the Fair Derby. Then at the end of the year, they have the United States National Championship. Costa Mesa has been running fluidly for 50 years until this year stopped it.
Costa Mesa also hosts different events like the Harley Davidson night and the MX Jumpers night. Those particular nights draw a lot of people and people like especially to see the Harley Davidsons race around the track. In the 90s, legendary and world champion, former world champion, Jack Milne had passed away. Rest in peace, Jack. And Harry Oxley took over the Costa Mesa Speedway. And he actually ran that for several years until he retired and moved to Mexico. Also, Brad Oxley, the son of Harry, took over promoting Costa Mesa Speedway. And Brad was involved with the track since probably he was in diapers. He was actually grooming the track and Brad knows every inch of the Costa Mesa Speedway and he now promotes it with his wife Jaylene. Brad is also a two-time United States Champion. I started racing Costa Mesa in 1975 and my last year full-time was in 2008. And I was there in 2012 and raced a few nights also. And Costa Mesa has always been my favorite speedway track of them all. All the legendary American speedway riders, all of them have ridden at Costa Mesa. There are so many riders who have ridden at Costa Mesa Speedway. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. Like we mentioned before, Costa Mesa Speedway has been running continuously for 50 years. And this is the first time, the first time they have not had a national championship or a season. However, Jason in New York, uh, last month he ran a national championship, the 2020 national championship, and Brock Nickel won that event. Twenty twenty has a national champion. It's Brock Nickel, and it's really great that Jason held that event in New York. We want to thank the Oxley family for all the hard years and all the hard work they've put into making Costa Mesa a success. I know it's a lot of work. It's hard. It's probably thankless too. So they've done a great job, and Speedway has really been good because of the Oxley family and the Costa Mesa Fairgrounds. All over Europe, they watch the uh, Costa Mesa Speedway. They're reading who's doing well, and the promoters are watching, and they're picking the riders, the young and up-and-coming riders, to ride on their teams from the write-ups from the Costa Mesa Speedway. We hope 2021 is going to be a good year for Costa Mesa Speedway. There are a few tracks running this year, like Paris Raceway. Steve Evans promoting that, doing a great job. And Fast Fridays up there, they're doing a great job up there also. So they're promoting Speedway, it's being run this year. And next year we hope to have it in full form. If you'd like to go ahead and watch more Speedway videos, we have them right here. And we appreciate you watching this vlog of Costa Mesa Speedway. Costa Mesa Speedway is an amazing event. It's an amazing racetrack, and we invite you to go to Costa Mesa when they open again. So please like, share, subscribe, and always ring that bell. Yeah, ring that bell. <laughs> hey, Costa Mesa is cool, and one of the early stars of Costa Mesa, the first glamour boy of Costa Mesa. This guy was handsome, and he was really famous, and. He was, a, he was a good rider. He actually bought his first house from the Costa Mesa Speedway. And he was talking to the crowd and with Bruce Flanders at the Industry Hills. And that is the one, the only, number 19, Sliding Sunny Nutter. Old timers in the grandstands and you youngsters, would you please welcome the 1968 California State Champion, Mr. Sunny Nutter. Wave at him, Sonny. Here he is. Sonny, when you won that title, what track were you running that puppy at? That was uh, Southgate Speedway, uh, which was known as Trojan Speedway. It was uh, a, yeah, half again as big as this. And I uh, won this track championship. 
points-wise and the state championship and didn't think a thing of it. <laughs> in, in front of a crowd of probably 35 or yeah, 40? Yeah, it wasn't so big, you know. I, I didn't uh, hit on me until later on how important of a race it was for me. But uh, I remember I had to battle uh, Steve Scott and Rick Woods pretty hard that night. And uh, we did it on a JAP. And that, that same jab that I won on was the bi bike that Ivan Major, who is here tonight, my hero, uh, that's the bike that he rode and blew up right away at Ascot because he never, he never gave it a breath. He just t turned it on wide open and wring his neck. But later we had uh, all the Speedway guys rode there and it was a serious deal. The next year, Costa Mesa opened and the face of Speedway in Southern California began a drastic change, didn't it? Yeah, and, and it changed my life. It actually changed. I grew long hair and a mustache and actually, uh, People liked looking at me. I, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, you had a fan club, right? Oh, big time. Big it was. It was. I, 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 I had a long time sitting on my tailgate signing autographs, and every person that I signed an autograph to, I talked to. I am not one of the ones that keeps his head down and just signs and hands the stuff out. I like to talk to everybody. Say, bring your friends next week. We need more money. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine how old somebody who, you, let's say you signed a five-year-old's autograph in 1968, they're almost ready for Social Security. I had a guy come up to me today, says, I was watching you when I was seven years old, and he brought my, he brought his uh, program over to get to sign and dumb me. I come with no pen, no business cards, no nothing, as usual, and uh, talked to me about when he was a little kid watching me ride, and then he showed me his kids and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it's neat. When you're all done racing, this is what you got. You got a lot of good memories, a lot of good friends, about 30 years, eight by 10 pictures, and, and uh, thank God I'm in one piece. And some x-rays, right? Oh, a few. Yeah. Then you went on, you wrote, drove midgets for a while? Yeah, we, uh, Bruce here and I, when Bruce came to Ascot and started doing the sprint car race, they say, hey, Bruce, come on, man. You don't know nothing about cars. Take these books home, read up. And he did, and he was the greatest announcer they had down there for years and got the place going strong. But Bruce and I announced a few, and J.C. Agajanian Jr., a few races together, and I'd get in my seat and I'd go, hey, how's everybody doing down there in turn one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you having some fun? You're seeing some old friends? Oh, yeah. It allows me to have really a lot of friends. Good. I'm glad you came. And, and you know what? You're right there on the top of the list, Bruce. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, come on. He doesn't get to hear many applause anymore. Would you tell Sonny Nutter you enjoy the man? Thank you, Sonny. I'd like to thank Jeff Immediato for dragging my ass down here. <laughs> okay, Jeffrey. Cool. All right. Thank you, buddy. Jay, thank you, sir. Sliding, Sonny. Boy, and he was, he was so smooth. Jeff, did you drag his ass down there at the industry? We're going to get you on that show, Jeff, and we're going to talk about that. And Sliding, Sonny Nutter was just fantastic. And I talked to Sonny a few weeks ago, and he said he'd come on the show. So where is that sliding Sonny Nutter? I have some stories to tell, and he has some stories to tell. So we want to see sliding Sonny Nutter. And the 70s was just an amazing time. It was this amazing time for Speedway. The riders were all classic. They were just original. They were really fantastic. I mean, the 1970s Speedway riders, they were all great. They were all unique. and. They were just really, really great guys. But the 70s had something more than the riders, and that was the Costa Mesa Speedway. That was pretty cool, too. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about some interesting things. And first, subscribe to the channel down below, the little red button. And we're going to talk about some Speedway and a lot more. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Today we're going to take a trip down memory lane. Back to the early days of the American Speedway back in the 1970s. The glory days. The days that we thought would never end. We're going to talk about that right now. Today we're going to talk not about the Speedway Riders, about the atmosphere 
about what's going on, mainly the Costa Mesa Fairgrounds, but we're going to talk about what it was like to be a Speedway fan in the 1970s. The first thing you think of is what? Gene, Gene, the dancing machine. Do you know who Gene was? Gene was a very famous party animal in the stands. And he would go in the stands and ignite the fans to cheer. More beer. It was a party animal. Everybody loved Gene, Gene, the dancing machine. It was just a total party. I mean, Gene was up there going crazy. Sometimes he would climb on the crash wall where the Speedway crash wall is, and he would be walking drunk on the crash wall. Walking, walking. And then all of a sudden he would yell, more beer! And everybody would go, yeah, Gene! It was awesome. Gene was the dancing machine. Uh, yelling more beer more beer everybody but he was not going to pay for that beer for everybody he just wanted you to buy maybe he had a percentage at the concession stands but gene was walking and he was yelling more beer and then he slip and he would fall and he would fall on his groin do the splits on the crash wall and he sang in soprano after that Besides watching the Speedway races when I was a little kid, one of my favorite parts of the Speedway was the fights. I, every Friday night there was fights. There were drunk guys in the stands. They just wanted something to do. So they'd go there and drink a lot of alcohol and then they would fight. So everyone stood, fight over there. And then a little bit later, fight over there. There was fights everywhere. And I was like, right on, right on. You got the speedway and then you got the fights. I wasn't really into chicks at that time. Those were the days of the SRA. Do you remember the SRA? Do you know the SRA? The Speedway Racing Association. That was governed by the president, Jerry Fairchild, and they guaranteed like 35% of the gate to the motorcycle riders. We like that as riders. Some of the riders, like Mike Bass, they would go home with $1,000 a night. Only the winners got a lot of money, but they were making a living. They were making like thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year if they were good. It was great. Those were the glory days of Speedway when the SRA was governing it. I think back in those days, the DG dirt was a lot cheaper. Why? Because they had lots of dirt on the outside. We saw guys like in the last blog, Danny Berserko Becker riding that crash wall on the wheelie. We saw lots of riders. They loved the outside. The outside had lots of traction for passing. And Billy Gray was one of the guys too. And also if you sat behind the wall, you got lots of dirt in your Coke or beer. And it was just crazy the amount of dirt that flew over. We used to have like mass tear offs and that dirt would go wow and would go all over the face mask. And we loved sitting where the mud was flying in our faces. Another great thing about early day Speedway back in the 70s was the smell, the castor oil and the nitro. They burned nitro in those days and the castor oil. It smelled like heaven. It was the most beautiful smell in the world, the castor oil. And it was just fantastic. I was a little young at that time, but one of the reasons why the 70s was so fantastic for Speedway was the chicks, the girls, all the hot looking chicks went to the Speedway. I was just a little kid, I didn't really pay attention that much. I liked the fights a little better, but the girls were really beautiful and the guys followed. It was just a hangout place to be. The chicks all came and then the guys came. They even had a fox night. A Bruce Penhall, Bruce the Fox Penhall, Fox Knight. All the chicks were free and all the dudes had to pay. That's not fair. And 
And who could forget Larry Huffman? Larry Huffman, the voice of the Grant Boys. And he was the announcer at the Speedway. And Larry was just an amazing announcer. He would just electrify the crowd every Friday night at Costa Mesa Fairgrounds. He was just amazing. He would just make a boring race exciting. He was just an amazing announcer. And he would do the Huffman Shuffle. The 1970s, who could forget those days? The glory days of Speedway. They were just absolutely great. Everyone just had a good time. The Speedway was fantastic. The living legends of the 70s. There can be no other better group of Speedway runners ever, including my group or any group. The group now, they can't compare. Sorry, guys. But the 1970s group, the Bass Brothers, the Woods, everybody was just amazing. You had the speedway races, and then you had the activity in the stands, the smell of the speedway bikes, Larry Huffman, the fights, the chicks, everything! Costa Mesa the Fairgrounds Friday night was a place to be! Well, that's it! 1970s! was one of the most amazing times in U.S. Speedway history. The revival of Speedway in 1968 and it carried through the 70s. So we want to thank you so much for watching the blog, my blog today. And we ask that you go ahead and subscribe. There's other videos right here you can go ahead and watch. That's fantastic. That was a really great era. So thank you so much for watching. And please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. Ring that bell. <laughs> hey, Bill Cody was a big part of the 70s, and he's actually a big part of Speedway today. He does a lot of great things for the Speedway riders, provides the bikes, the parts. I mean, Bill Cody was just an amazing guy, but before he was an amazing guy, he was an amazing rider, and he just tore it up. I mean, Bill Cody was one of the most unbelievable riders when he was uh, younger in his day. Maybe not now. <laughs> But when he was younger, Bill Cody tore it up. He actually rode that long track really good. And uh, he was he was beating like Ivan Major and Barry Briggs in their prime. So Bill Cody was just an amazing rider. And he was fast and he was he was ranked a top three or top four in the AMA one mile race at Sacramento. I mean, Bill Cody was a racer. One of my favorite guys of all time in Speedway has got to be Wild Bill Cody. We became really good friends, but when I was young, I wasn't even know the guy. And he was fast and he was smooth. And he was fast and he was smooth and he was just really good. Bill won quite a few races and he was always in the hunt. And he was smooth and he was just really good. Bill won quite a few races and he was always in the hunt. And he... and he was always right there, number one or two or three. You know, he was always fighting these Bass Brothers and Woods who were just fantastic. I mean, this. I mean, this early day group was just classic. I mean, they will never be forgotten. Yeah. God bless the early day Speedway Riders. They were just awesome.
and Bill Cody was one of them. And I ended up racing him. <laughs> And I ended up racing him later in his career, and I beat him a couple of times. Bill was just fantastic, and I really like Bill Cody as a person. Bill Cody, is, he supplies motorcycles. Bill Cody was just a great racer, great guy. Just, you know, love you, Bill. A classic, a legend of all legends, wild Bill Cody. He's not very wild, but he is Bill Cody. And he's talking about the younger Speedway riders in his older days here. Bill, tell me about being at this uh, Legends, Le legends night. night. It's good. It's good to see everybody here, and uh, I'm glad to be here. From your, from your early days of racing, what do you think about those kids that are starting to race right now? This is a change right here tonight. It's uh, the, the kids are taking over. Get rid of the 50-year-old club. Do you think this next generation has what it takes to bring home another world, oh, yeah. uh, world championship? Yeah, yeah. Very, I mean, our last very world much champion so. is in his 40s, and uh, <laughs> that's for longevity. But no, uh, no. This is this group of kids we got now. It reminds me of that group back then, the Greg Hancocks, the Billy Hamill. So we have the same group of kids right now. They're they're going to produce world champions. Did you hear that? They're going to produce world champions. We got Max Romo. Uh, we've got Dylan now racing in Europe, and we have Brock Nickel, Luke Becker, and a whole slug of great young riders coming up. So. Bill Cody knows that these guys are good, and if Bill Cody says something, you better believe Wild Bill Cody, because he's been around the block what, a couple times, and he's just a famous, famous writer. He actually was the top point getter, the point top point money earner at the Costa Mesa in the early days. He made a lot, a lot of money racing motorcycles, so much that he was going to be a school teacher. And he said, nah, I'm not going to go to Orange Coast College. I'm going to go ahead and race Speedway. And he was very successful. And the rest was history. Bill Cody really is an amazing guy and he's just an amazing ambassador to sport you know he supplies all those bikes and parts for the riders he's been there so many years and now his son bobby i think is starting to take over the business as bill gets older now and we just really you know we're almost worship bill cody because he is just a legend of all legends wild bill cody and just a great guy and another great guy was uh danny berserko becker do you remember Danny Berserko Becker, he was one of the great riders of the day. He just was this crazy good rider, and he just knew how to ride a speedway bike so good. I mean, when Danny Becker got on a speedway bike, man, everybody watched Danny Becker. Why? Because he's the only one that could ride into turn one and two, riding a wheelie on the crash wall and riding all the way around. Nobody in the history of speedway could do that except for one guy, that's Danny Pazurko Becker. Welcome back. And I want to thank you so much for subscribing to the channel. My channel, the Speedway channel. And we really appreciate your support. So just please click on that red button. And today we have a very fun vlog. We have a very fun with a very special writer. He's one of the most talented writers in American history. He was incredible on a motorcycle. I will talk about it right now. Danny was born in 1955 and he was kind of a typical kid. He played Little League Baseball. Danny's life came changing completely when he met Ron Stewart. Orange County Welding. Ron took him under his wings along with other riders such as Gene Woods.
Ron was an early day speedway rider at the Costa Mesa Fairgrounds and he took a special interest in developing young boys to be speedway racers and Danny Becker was the next in line to be developed. Danny would ride his bike and help Ron with the parts and he would haul the parts on his bicycle, the engines, and he would ride it to Ron's shop. Ron and Danny developed a very good friendship. Ron saw the talent that Danny had and he went ahead and got him a Speedway bike. And Danny just was incredible, a young boy. When Danny was just 16, he had his first Speedway race and he was fearless. Danny didn't know how to ride a Speedway bike, but one way, that was WFO wide effing open. Danny just rode that thing crazy. I remember one time at Costa Mesa, he just rode that bike on a wheelie all the way around the wall. You know, the wall, the outer wall at Costa Mesa. He actually planted against the wall, rode the whole wall with a wheelie and won the race. People were amazed. I have never, ever seen anyone do that, even to this day. It's completely insane. And that's Danny Berserko Becker. Danny never rode overseas in Europe. I wonder why. But he was in three United States Nationals, 1972, 73, and 74. In the prime of Danny's career, he was unstoppable. Everybody liked who? Danny Becker. He was just famous and he was a crowd favorite. Anytime Danny went on the track, everybody, all eyes were glued on who? Danny Becker. Even the announcer, Larry Huffman, when he announced it, he would do the shuffle. And then Larry would announce, Danny Berserko Becker! And everybody just went crazy. Danny was a very handsome speedway rider. And all the girls liked who? Danny Becker. That was before Bruce Fennell, I think. And Danny Becker just had a problem. One of his problems was he had to change his telephone number nine times. Why? Because the chicks were calling and pranking him and saying, Hey, Danny, I want to meet you. I want to have your baby and stuff. And Danny's like, I can't take it. Danny is a nice guy and he doesn't like that kind of stuff. So Danny changed his number nine times from the women. I will always love Danny to pieces forever. But if there was one fault that Danny had, it was he partied too much. Danny got caught up in the party scene. Possibly that led to his downfall as far as his progress as a world-class speedway rider. But Danny was just an amazing guy. He had a heart of gold. He was beloved by all. I actually was friends with Danny Becker. I met him in 1976. When I was thumbing through the register in the want ads, I found a Speedway bike for sale and I called him and it was Danny Berserko Becker. And he had the bike for sale. I guess one of his sponsors gave him this JAP. It was like brand new and he didn't want it no more. He wanted the money so he sold it to me. I bought that bike and we became good friends after that. But Danny was just an amazing guy and he helped me race Speedway. Very good.
Danny married his sweetheart, Guerin, September 14th, 2013. It was just a few months before he had passed away. Danny was fighting stage three of a terminal cancer and he wanted to be married before he passed away. Danny was just an amazing man, beloved by all. He left a couple children and he just left a loving wife. His wife stayed with him for like 10 or 15 years before their marriage and they just had a happy life together. Danny was just a good guy. He really cared about people and he just was just kind hearted. If he was driving his car and he saw an injured animal, Danny would stop and take care of that injured animal. He was just an amazing human being. We don't know that side of Danny Becker, but it's true. Danny was just a great person. He always treated people good and he always talked nice to people. He was just a kind hearted man, Danny Becker. Just before Danny had passed away, he turned to his wife and said, I am the luckiest person in the world. It's because he was loved. Danny knew that everyone loved him. He was just beloved by all. Danny passed away November 23rd, 2013, a couple months after he was married, and he approached death with bravery. He approached death like WFO. He just didn't care. He was just a brave guy. Danny Becker was just an amazing human being. He died with dignity and everyone misses Danny Becker and he's loved by all, even to this day. Well, that's it. Danny Berserko Becker. Rest in peace, Danny. See you on the other side. Just an amazing person. So we want to thank you so much for watching the Danny Berserko Becker blog today. Danny Becker got his name Berserko. Why? Because he rode Berserko. He was just an amazing character. We all love Danny. So thank you so much again for watching the blog. We appreciate it. Please like and share. There's other videos here you can watch too. So we appreciate that. So please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. Yeah, we love Danny Becker. I mean, I almost cried because I love that guy. He's just so nice. And, you know, I would see Danny in the stands during the races and when he finished racing. And he was just like, hi, Brian. And he was just the sweetest, kindest uh hearted individual you've ever met Danny Berserko Becker I mean he wouldn't hurt a fly he was just a sweet guy loving guy he respectful to women that's why when the girls called him and said those kind of things he didn't really like that because he's just a good person and another good person is actually one of the greatest female speedway riders of the 70s this lady was good she was a young gal and I raced her a couple times and every time that she got on the track, she was a threat. And so we we're always kind of a fearful, like we got to step up our game. And when we raced this gal, she was good. Sarah Kors is the gal who's a very good rider today. And this gal was a very good rider of the 70s. She was really a hot rider. And her name is Bobby Hunter. Today we're going to talk about one of the greatest United States Speedway riders in women's class for the 500s. That's number 280, Bobby Hunter. Her nickname is simple, it's Bobby. She was born in Fontana, California on July 3rd with her parents always supporting her. Her father was a hell's angel, believe it or not. I met him when he was an old man, and he didn't look like a hell's angel. He was very nice, along with his mother also. Out here on the road. She has one son named Colby. He was an Iraq war vet, sergeant, and a baseball player and coach, professional. Ten. Bobby loves animals. If you see her, she just has tons of animals. Dogs, cats, horses, everything. She's an animal lover.
She started racing TT at the age of 11 and raced all the way till 16. She turned pro. She was racing quarter mile, half mile, everything. And she started racing Speedway at the age of 17. Colorado Mountain Snow. She was a good Speedway rider because of all that experience racing TT. Bobby was awesome and one of the best Speedway riders ever in women's class. In Wyoming. With the 500s. Of course, there's great junior riders that are women, but Bobby was racing the big boys with the 500s and she was good. Been a long time. I watched a YouTube video a few weeks ago of Ole Funden. He was like a world champion or champion in Europe many years ago. And she raced her daughter on ice. And it was Bobby Hunter and Ole Funden's daughter. And guess what? Bobby kicked her butt. I was very surprised. You think Ole Funden's daughter would be very good, but Bobby just smoked that girl. I start to feel my life she was a stunt rider. She did a lot of stunt riding when she was young, and she raced Speedway from 1976 to 1991. She rode all the tracks. She was an amazing rider, she gifted rider. Bobby Hunter. I only raced Bobby one time, one time, and that's when she came to the Santa Ana Bowl. And she was good. I watched her heat races. She was beating all the guys up. And I, was, I had her like in a semi. And I said, oh, I have to ride fast to beat this girl. She was scary. She scared the bumblebee. And I said, oh, I must go. Luckily for me, I was able to take Bobby but she was fast and I just had to give it everything I had to beat that girl. She was good. Sunrise in the Florida Keys Takes my breath away In 2019, Bobby was part of the Legends Night at Industry Hill Speedway. She is a legend. Seen so many places Still don't know where I found. That's it. Bobby Hunter, number 280, one of the best writers and a female writer in the United States history. Rolling on from town to town. I've seen so many places. Still don't know where I found. We love Bobby Hunter and she's just a fantastic uh, individual and she's been slated to be on the show. So we're waiting for Bobby Hunter since like January of 2021. So get your computer ready, Bobby, and get on that show or get your cell phone. Who cares? But we have that video of Bobby Hunter and Olaf Funden's daughter. It wasn't ice, like I said. It was actually, I think it was that concrete, that really slick concrete track. The one that I think Bobby Schwartz and... Uh, Sean McConnell won that short track. It's at uh, Wimbledon or something like that. Wembley, one of those places in Europe. But we have that particular race, and we found that one. And they were racing, and it looked like ice because it was so slick. That concrete was slick as ice. But now for something you haven't seen before, certainly on this program anyway, a challenge between two women riders, Bobby Hunter, who races regularly in California, and Madeline Funden, daughter of Sweden's ex-world champion, Ovi Funden. It was a best of three race meeting between the two, and before they started, Gary Newborn spoke to the girls and first asked Bobby how she thought it would work out. Well, I've never really seen Madeline ride outside of practice here, but hopefully we're both going to put on a pretty good show and, and it'll be a competitive race. What are your tactics going to be, Madeline? Pardon me, I didn't hear. What, what are your tactics going to be against Bobby? <laughs> I'm just going to do my best. <laughs> That's it. A moment of Speedway history. Over the years on World of Sport, we've seen the sport in the rain, in the fog, in the snow, in a blizzard, in the desert, on ice, on concrete, even on crushed ant hills. 
but this is a very rare moment. Girl riders, two women riders for the first time in an official British mixture for nigh on 50 years since the days of Faye Taylor and Eva Asquith back in the roaring 20s. We have never seen lady riders before. That is a very famous name in Speedway, Madeline Funden. She'll be in red, the 19-year-old daughter of five times world champion Ovi Funden and her opponents, much more experienced, Bobby Hunter in the white helmet color, 25-year-old from California who races regularly against the men, although it has to be said she hasn't raced for 18 months. So it's going to be tricky out there for the girls as off they go. Madeline Funden snakes in the corner. Bobby Hunter has overcooked it, has gone down, and she's brought down Madeline as well. And oh dear, the girls have made a crashing impact on Wembley. Let's have a look at it again, and you'll see that uh, Bobby Hunter really is the victim of impetuosity here. She gets to the corner first, does it all right, turns the throttle on, and just turns a beautiful pirouette. Madeline Funden clips her. That brings her down as well. And, well, it's been difficult for the men, so it must be difficult for the girls going out there cold. So the restart. Neither of the lassies done the worse for that tumble. This is Madeline Funden, of course, her dad Ovi, such a legend at Norwich and latterly at Bellevue. Bobby Funden drives a forklift truck for a living in California. And let's hope they don't uh, overdo it again away this time. And it's Bobby Hunter, but still takes it to the corner. And there's no question, the girl has got the right technique. In fact, uh, oh, and Madeline Funden almost tasted the boards there. Did well to avoid her. This is Bobby Hunter. You can see, maybe she's not going quite as fast as the men. Madeline Funden in a little bit of trouble at the back. Bobby Hunter untroubled. By our reckoning, she's going a little bit under two seconds, a lap slower than the men. But, uh, oh, Bobby, you really must not turn on too much gas. The last lap. And again, he really uh, does grab bottled by the fistful. But the crowd are loving her for her efforts. And so for the second race in this Queen of Wembley. And Hunter away again from the outside, although Madeline Funden rode a crafty line around the inside and she's in front. Back comes uh, Hunter. Funden going around again, leaves the gap and Bobby Hunter is through. And well, the girls are really having a dice up. Bobby Hunter say, looking as though she's stood it up nonsense from her lesser experienced rival. Who's in front now? Let's watch her style. And as she gets clear, her cornering technique is genuine speed weight. Just knocks it off a little too long going into the turns, perhaps. And she looks the part. Going clear now. Bobby Hunter, the Californian bombshell, wins the second lead race. And that makes her the queen of Wembley. And she's a queen who certainly isn't lacking. That looks hard riding on that concrete and it looked like she had a tough time out there. I think I would have had a hard time. There was no dirt on that track. It was smooth concrete. That's crazy. And Bobby was riding that thing pretty good. She was giving it some gas and that mix up of the, the last race that they were like putting each other in the wall. That was really cool stuff. And nobody got hurt. That was the main thing. So that's Bobby Hunter. She really was an amazing rider. And, uh, you know, she just was good. I mean, Bobby Hunter, she did really well. And then actually she got hurt really bad one time. And I think that was the end of her career. But before that time, Bobby Hunter was really, truly an amazing rider. And so we'd love to see Bobby Hunter on the show and uh, just go ahead and talk to her about her early days because she was a really great speedway rider. Make no doubt about that. Bobby Hunter was a living legend of the early lady speedway riders. She was good and actually she was the best. So we, we go ahead and appreciate Bobby Hunter for everything she's done. And lastly, we have the voice of the Costa Mesa Speedway. We had him on the show and he's really a great guy. And he was just a living legend. He's still living. He's had some health problems, but he's just an amazing guy, great guy. 
I uh, met that guy one time when I was a young writer, and I just always admired him. And that's Larry Huffman. Welcome back. And today we're going to blog a very special person. But first, we want to thank you for subscribing. We have a flood of subscribers to the channel. Thank you so much. And today we're going to talk about a very famous announcer. He was a super mouth. His name is Larry Huffman. Larry started his announcing career in the early 70s at the Costa Mesa Speedway. One of his first interviews was the legendary Gene Woods. He was a child, a kid at the time. Larry razzled dazzled the fans for many years and he was the one to do the Huffman Shuffle. Do you know what that is? The Huffman Shuffle? It was when he announced very famous writers and he would go crazy and the crowd would go crazy too. Larry Huffman is the oldest living great motorsport announcer today and he got his start in Supercross it was one of the things he did in 1972 he did the Los Angeles Coliseum Supercross Larry was just legendary in Supercross for many years. He did Supercross, he did Motocross, he did hill climbing. Larry did it all. Larry, at the Speedway races, he wore a tuxedo. He was the only announcer I know that wore a tuxedo. And when I was just a 16-year-old kid, I met Larry Huffman. I was getting ready for racing that night, and Larry Huffman comes in and says, reads my name and says, Hi, Brian, how you doing? He had no idea who I was. And I said, fine, Larry, I know who he was. And he said, so tell me more about you. And so I start telling him about me. And Larry is just a great guy, personable. Also, Larry cared about the Speedway Riders. I really appreciate that about Larry. And I want to give you a shout out. Except my friend request on Facebook, okay, Larry? And Larry just picketed for the Speedway Riders. When they had the SRA strike, Larry was out there in full force for the Speedway Riders. Larry had lots of sayings when he was announcing. He would say, he's slicker than a mayonnaise sandwich. No damage done except for in his underwear. He's tougher than a $2 steak. He's on him like a dog on a piece of meat. Larry's TV credits include Fantasy Island, Chips, Knight Rider, Miami Vice, and Charlie's Angels. Larry's been on every major TV station, the sports channels, all the major stations, and he co-wrote and co-produced on Any Sunday Part 2. I feel kind of funny doing a blog on a legendary announcer because Larry Huffman was one of the best, but they call him Supermouth. Why did they call him Supermouth? Because he spoke 300 words per minute. Larry Huffman was the greatest, fastest announcer ever in the world. I guess I'm no Larry Huffman, huh? <laughs> Larry suffered a serious infection that nearly cost him his life. It was an infection of his leg and it laid him up for quite a while.
Larry has an amazing voice and he did video games like Spider-Man, Whiplash, Rock and Roll, and Sammy Sosa. He had lots of video games and he did more. Larry even won the award of the 1994 Miller Lite commercial Wiener Dog Winter Nationals. He was a Wiener Dog voice and it won many awards. It was on the Super Bowl, World Series, Olympics. Larry's voice was worldwide. One time I was in a recording studio in Anaheim, California and I was doing some work for one of my movies and I looked at the next booth over and there was Larry Huffman recording commercials. He probably did like 10,000 commercials. He was the voice of the Grant Boys. Larry resides in Big Bear, California. One of the great things about Larry is he still has a sense of humor after all these years. Well, that's it. Larry Huffman, an amazing voice, golden voice. God gave him that gift. And we want to thank you for watching the blog on Larry Huffman. And we want to wish him lots of health for many years to come. Once again, thank you so much for watching my blog and we'd like to invite you to watch some more videos here. So thank you so much and please like, share, subscribe and ring that bell. Yeah, we love Larry Huffman. He's really great. And uh, we're going to go ahead and play the last video of the show. We're going to replay this one with Bruce the Fox Penhall and his his acting debut on the love boat he was on the cruise ship and he met a woman he proposed and he's getting married he was popping out of boxes bruce penhall was everywhere hi everyone did you see that the love boat is coming back on cbs access i'm so excited it's been years since we did it, it was back when i did the mandrell sister show i got to do an episode with bruce penhall who actually played larry wilcox's little brother in chips which i watched all the time and so that made it even more exciting so we wanted to share some of it with y'all hope you enjoy it exciting and have the time of your life my treat robert he hasn't forgotten i wonder what he sent. happy birthday i'm neil i'm your birthday present for robert you mean you saw pictures of me in his locker yeah. and you took it upon yourself to send yourself to me as a gift yeah i guess one little nightcap couldn't hurt
I see you've decided to keep your gift. Uh, and I got another one to go along with it. Oh. Somehow both of them look permanent. <laughs> Now, if a girl threw that cake in my face, that would be it. The wedding would be over, the engagement would be over, everything would be over. I would be done with that girl, but Bruce went ahead and married her on the love boat. So that was Bruce Penhall's acting debut. That was really fun on the love boat. We love Bruce Penhall. And I like him when he comes out of that box, like, happy birthday, honey. He's dressed in that ribbon, like, I love you or something. That was really good. And hopefully all of our birthdays, we can open this box and Bruce Penhall is going to jump out of the box. That was cool. I like that one. So we appreciate you joining us uh, today for the video blog. And it was just really great. Part two of the 1970s Speedway. It was really great. And there was some really great riders. And we could talk maybe another video about uh, the 1970s, it was really great. And there's just classic guys. And we'll talk more about that later. So thank you so much for joining the blog. We appreciate that. We want to wish you guys to have, have, have a great day. Be safe. If you go riding, stay on the two wheels. And always be careful. And never crashing. We don't like crashes. Thank you so much. And have a great day.